please rise for the call to worship. And I will be reading both my part and the people's part. And if any of you read my part, I forgive you. We gather here to worship God, whose steadfast love endures forever. We gather surrounded by God's Holy Spirit, who encourage us to walk faithfully with Christ. Praise be to God, whose goodness and mercy fills our days. Praise be to God, whose ways lead to peace and justice. We now invite the children to leave as uh, we want to make sure they have plenty of time for their Sunday school time. And I know they're going to have communion in the Sunday school room together this morning. And Pastor Jay is going to be with them, which I think is just delightful. And then let us turn to the opening hymn. We want to welcome Vicki Campos this morning. Erica's not with us today, and Vicki agreed to lead us in song. And I think we are all agreed that we need someone to lead us in song. So we are truly grateful from the bottom of our hearts for Vicki being here and for Chris being here, bringing his usual musicians, musicianship. So we are going to sing together, Together We Serve. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki and Chris. This happens to be one of those mornings where I only have one announcement, and it's an important one. I'm also a little worried that maybe I've forgotten something. The last 24 hours has been really chaotic for me for reasons that are not important enough to go into. But if I've forgotten something, I'll just ask your forgiveness. But the thing that I remember is truly very important. So we have flowers this morning from Becky Yui, and they are in Bill's memory. And I thought it would be nice if we just take a moment to some silence. And those of you who knew Bill, I want you to take a moment and just think of a happy memory of Bill. And those of you who never knew Bill, just take a moment and think of a loved one that you have lost and think of a happy moment. Let's just take a moment of silence together.
Thanks be to God. I have a mission spotlight or mission moment this morning. And I decided just to share something. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what can we possibly do to make a difference? And I heard this story and it just really touched my heart. So I want to tell you about a little boy named Ryan. When he was three years old, so are you listening? Three years old, hold up your fingers. Three years old, he went to his, with his dad to the recycling center. And he decided that this was a cause he wanted to devote his life to. Now, I don't remember devoting my life to anything when I was three, except maybe having as many desserts as I could. But Ryan decided this was important. So he went to the neighbors and he asked them to give him their recycling. And it grew from there. His dad created a website, Ryan's Recycling. And he even, his dad even ended up getting some trucks with the logo on it. When Ryan goes to the beach and he finds trash and abandoned toys, he thinks beach cleanup. He picked up two buckets of trash in one visit, and he found sand toys that he then donated so they could be given away. He's now 12 years old, and he has recycled 1.4 million cans and bottles, more than 150,000 pounds. Now there's days I ask myself, what can I possibly do and if you ever have that moment, just think of Ryan, who when he was very good, he decided he had a mission that he wanted to devote himself to, and he's already made a difference in, in the world. So that is a beautiful thing to remember. Let us turn now to our time of scripture, and Lori Milheiser is going to say it for us. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and verses 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But if you have dishonored the poor, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you, you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Thanks be to God. I'm happy to say it is not often you have seen me rummaging around or something just before my sermon, but I made a mistake and I want to make sure I correct it. And some of you know, if you give, if there's last minute changes and I write it in, I forget to read it at the time I need to read it. So I'm writing it again so I don't forget. And I'm just asking your forgiveness. And if you can't forgive me, we'll talk later.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, may we remember that love and forgiveness is the strength of our song. May we hear these words of scripture. May they inform us and inspire us. May we hear your voice. Amen. So as an appointed pastor who goes where I'm sent, and also as the daughter of a minister who also went where he was sent, I have been in a variety of churches and a variety of places over the years, in Southern California primarily. And I have had the privilege of having some famous people be part of my churches over the years. And few have been really active, most have just attended. But you know what happens when a celebrity comes into worship, right? Or can you imagine? There's a stir. Some people turn around and look. Some people want to, but they kind of look like that because they don't want anyone to know they're turning around and looking. And it's just a stir in the congregation. Andy Griffith, Heather Locklear, Ben Affleck are all celebrities who've attended churches I've served. Jennifer Garner is actually very active in her home church. And before COVID, the church would have refreshments after church. Remember that? And she would sign up for her turn. And she would be there. She would make the refreshments at her home. She would bring them. She would serve them. It was just delightful. And her children were part of the Sunday school and the Christmas play. Polly Perrette is a TV actress, and, and she's also very active in her home church in Hollywood. But for the most part, celebrities just make the occasional appearance. And I understand why people get so excited. I do it too. I have had the privilege of baptizing Franklin Delano Roosevelt's great-grandchild, and I am very proud of that. I am so proud of it. I have mentioned it in a sermon before. But I know that baptism isn't any more important than any other baptism in the eyes of God. This scripture says a lot about the wealthy getting special treatment. And that happens in our society too, right? If we were standing in a line waiting to get in somewhere and a celebrity showed up, would we be surprised if they were taken to the front of the line and ushered right in? No, we'd be more surprised if they got in the line behind us, right? We're used to people getting special treatment. Sometimes in churches, wealthy people have an above average presence. I am happy to say that in most of the churches I've served, the people who give the most didn't want anyone to know that they gave the most. Sometimes I've even had people think they give the most, but they don't know that there's someone else. But in some churches, it is kind of made obvious in fact, in one church I served, the way to raise money was for one person to know what another person gave, and then they would give more just to match what that person gave. It was a bit competitive if you didn't pick up on that. And sometimes people give money to the church as a way to have power in the church. Years ago, I preached a sermon that someone disagreed with. I know that's shocking, but it just does happen every decade or so. And sometimes when someone, in fact, most of the time, if someone disagrees with me, we just have a nice conversation about it. Occasionally, I've been yelled at. But one time in particular, a wealthy church member knew that at the church that, that knew that at that church, I looked at what was given every Sunday. And the reason was that particular church had, uh, would get confused about where the special gifts were supposed to go. So they knew that I kept track of those special gifts to make sure that it got to the right place. It all started with an UMCOR number that got sent in wrong. 
So one particular Sunday, there was a very large gift given to an organization that I didn't think very highly of. And I knew that that gift was given just so that I would know. And so that the church, you know, if the church is given money that needs to go somewhere, it has to go to the place to which it's given. So that was one way for that person to make a point without saying a word. Sometimes money can be a carrot and sometimes it can be a stick. Our scripture passage refers to people with gold rings and fine clothes and the special attention they might get. And it then says, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. That is a specific reference that we might not understand without some research. It's actually referring to what happened in court in those days. The wealthy got to sit on raised benches. The poor sometimes got no bench at all. There was a custom in those days when wealthy people pulled into court people that had very little because they knew they could use the court to take what they wanted. The courts favored the wealthy in their rulings. Our courts still often favor the wealthy. You know, there's that phrase, whomever can hire the best lawyer wins, right? And often what it takes to hire the best lawyer is having the most money, which is part of why some of the people idealize are some of the lawyers who, who have worked without counting the money who have worked to represent those who could not afford to be properly represented in the courts. That's why I love Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They both fought for people who couldn't fight for themselves. Our society still favors the wealthy and the famous, which is why I started talking about celebrities I have known. But I'm confident that if we took a poll this Sunday morning, we would all agree that all of us are equal in God's sight. Right? And yet, we still sometimes cater to the wealthy and the famous. As I told you, I've served in multiple churches and wealthy communities. And one of the wealthiest people in one of the wealthiest churches I've ever served would tell you that they weren't wealthy. And you know why? Because there were the people in that community that had more money than they do. This is when I lived in Newport Beach and there were people like the Seegerstroms and the Samuelis and the Muscos who had a lot of money and gave a lot of money and were known for giving a lot of money. And I went to many of those society fundraisers and events. And oftentimes I would be sitting with someone I didn't know. And when they found out I was a pastor, they often didn't know what to say to me. I mean it. And so when they found out who I was, they'd be polite for a minute or two and then they turned to their neighbor and talked to their neighbor. Now, to be clear, I took some amusement in this. I didn't see myself as less important than they were. Now, maybe that sounds arrogant, but truly, since I was a child, I have felt value as a child of God. And I extend that value to all people. So I never felt agitated that people saw me as less important because I knew they were wrong. And I never even really felt it inside except once. And that's when Jamie Lee Curtis gave me a look that said clearly I was beneath her notice, even though she was asking me to fix a problem that she was having. <laughs> But I don't want to dwell on this point too long for this church because this isn't a problem in this church. 
Ones who give the most don't expect power in return. I don't think anyone here is a celebrity. And if I'm wrong, please correct me after the service. We do sometimes become the church of the loudest voice, meaning sometimes we cater to someone who speaks the most loudly rather than taking that moment to pray and reflect and making a wise choice going forward. But that truly is a side note because I haven't seen it happen very often and during COVID hardly at all. But I mention it because I think it is this church's greatest flaw. And it's one that we are going to have to address before we can truly become the church that God calls us to be. In James 2, 14 through 17, it says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Faith, if it has no works, is dead. More than 35 years ago, I wrote my sermon for ordination. Now, I don't remember a lot about my sermon, but I remember it was about what we do when we believe. And I remember that a board of ordained ministry member pushed me on that point. She reminded me that we believe in salvation by faith alone and that my sermon had tipped the scale a little too far towards a focus on works. Now, of course, I remember this because when you write a sermon for the Board of Ordained Ministry, you only turn in what you think is your best effort, right? And then here someone was giving me feedback that lovingly pointed out a flaw in my sermon, and it was truly a humbling moment. I pushed the line in the focus on works. Well, James also pushes that line. When James asks, can faith save you? What does James think our answer is supposed to be? No. But any reader of Paul's letters would say, yes, faith can save us. But James' point is that we need to have our actions match our faith, that our actions need to match our faith. We cannot just be hearers of the word. We need to be doers also. We need to have integrity with our faith. We need to love our neighbor. Can faith save you, James asks. I would say, yes, it can, it does. But do works matter? Yes, they do. Every word we say, every action we take, every action we fail to take. But it's not about perfection. It's about being able to say, I'm sorry. It's about being able to acknowledge when we haven't lived with integrity. It's about repenting and doing better. It's about forgiving others. My sermon title is Faith Works. When I wrote it, I was thinking about the dichotomy of faith and works. But I realized as I was writing this sermon that it has a different meaning. Faith works. It really does. When we are at our last nerve, faith works to rescue us so we keep going. And when we don't have the strength to go one more step, 
Faith works to give us that strength to take one more step than another. And when we're so angry with someone that we never want to talk to them again, let alone use the word forgiveness, if we even just take a moment and pray about it, and yes, sometimes it takes several moments, long moments to pray about it. By faith, the Holy Spirit works within us and helps us to become a person who is able to forgive. It's not about perfection. It's about being able to repent and do better. It's about forgiving others. It's even about forgiving ourselves. The Oak Ridge Boys wrote a song that I shared once before, and I wanted to share a portion of the lyrics because I just love these lyrics. I wonder what I'm doing here, day to day, year to year, standing still. Somewhere there's a teacher with a heart that never quits, staying after school to help some inner city kids, a mother who's a volunteer, a soldier in the fight. I can't help but ask myself when I lay down at night, did I make a difference in somebody's life? What hurts did I heal? What wrongs did I right? Did I raise my voice in defense of the truth? Did I lend my hand to the destitute? When my race is run, when my song is sung, well, I have to wonder, did I make a difference? Did I make a difference? Will I look back someday and say that I did all I could? Today we will share in communion together. I don't know anyone who doesn't find holy communion humbling. We are reminded that God has been with us since the beginning of time. We are reminded of the witness of the life of Christ. We are reminded that Christ died on the cross for us, for all of us. We are reminded that there is nothing else we need to do in order to receive this gift except to be people of faith. People who love Jesus with our heart and soul, however imperfectly, we are able to do that. And yet, if we don't show that love, if we don't show our gratitude by loving our neighbor and striving to make a difference in this world, then maybe our faith is a rootless thing. And we know that anything without roots dies. So may we be people of faith and people of works. And may we remember what I was reminded of this week. Faith works. Let us pray. Oh Lord, sometimes we think we are unimportant. Please remind us how very important we are in your eyes. Sometimes we think someone else is not important. Please remind us how important they are in your sight. Lord, sometimes in our relationships, we say words we regret. Help us to acknowledge our wrongdoing and ask forgiveness and restore that relationship. Sometimes, Lord, we fail to be the people you call us to be. May you help us see those moments, acknowledge those moments, repent and turn around and try again to be the people you have called us to be. And above all else, we give thanks, O oh Lord, for your everlasting love, your unconditional love, and that you shower our lives with grace upon grace. Amen. So now the note that I made to myself so I would not forget when my sermon was over, we have special music. 
And so Vicki is going to sing for us the song, Thy Word is a Lamp Unto My Feet. Thank you so much. I have loved that song since I was a teenager. And I think of it as a new song, but that was a while ago. We have uh, some prayer requests this morning. Uh, I've been asked to lift up Anne Syria. Just, uh, she's just having a hard time, and, and so we need to keep her uh, lifted up in our prayers. And then Dick Grosskloss, he broke his leg, which we sent out in the church email, but he's still waiting for surgery, we believe. And we're not sure if he's still in Yuma or if he's come home. So there's a lot going on in that whole family. And so just prayers for them, prayers of love and support and healing. Um, Linda had her surgery and it went well and she's home and recovering. As you might guess, she's going to be out of the office uh, while she's recovering. And uh, so I also give thanks for those who are doing extra duty in the office. We, uh, Ken had his surgery this week and he is doing well. So we're very glad about that. And then Lynn is going to have surgery this Wednesday to have a stent put in her carotid artery. So prayers for her and both of them, uh, especially in this time of of healing and recovery and prayers that um, being together in their healing time will just uh, improve that time of healing together. I also just wanna lift up that uh, on September 11th, it's the 20th anniversary of something that uh, we cannot ever forget. And so I'm gonna ask if, well, do it whenever you want to, but I'm going to 11 o'clock on Saturday, take a moment in prayer. And I invite you to do the same. I'll send out an email this week with a prayer that you can use if you want to. And, uh, but your prayers are just as beautiful before God. So don't feel like you have to use it. However, you uh, would like to, to lift up prayers of support for the families who lost loved ones and for all the many ways that that had been impacted the world. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come before you lifting up those who've had surgery or are facing surgery. We especially at this time, Lord, we need to give thanks for the doctors and nurses who sacrifice of themselves so that we can be healed, so that we can be cared for. And in this very difficult time when COVID patients fill our hospitals, we know this has to be such a difficult time. And so we just ask for for love and support for all our medical personnel. 
And we lift up, Lord, those who are facing life choices. So many times, Lord, we're at a fork in a road, and sometimes there's a left path and a right path, and sometimes there's a branch of many paths, and we just don't know which one to take. But we long, Lord, to take the fork that you call us to do. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you will help each one who is facing these choices to hear your voice, to be guided by your Holy Spirit, and to know which are good paths and which are not paths that we should follow. And we lift up, O oh Lord, the importance of September 11th. It is a day of so much loss and so much grief that sometimes it can overwhelm us. But it was also a day when we were reminded of the importance of lover, of neighbor, loving neighbor. And we pray, O oh Lord, that some of those memories will also be part of that day. Oh Lord, we are ever grateful that you are present in our lives. We pray in thanksgiving for the times we hear your voice. We pray in thanksgiving for those times when maybe we can't hear so well and you send someone else to make things more clear to us. We pray, oh Lord, that all of us, we will have ears to listen and our hands and feet to do according to your will. And we continue to pray with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of my favorite communion hymns is In Remembrance. And so I thought to transition to this time when we share communion together, that we would sing this hymn. So please rise as you are able and we'll sing In Remembrance. In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this wine.
Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall flow down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. which is a gift unto all of us.
Let us pray. Well, Lord, we give thanks for these gifts, these common elements of bread and juice. They represent your love and your grace. May your love and your grace dwell within us. May your love and grace flow through us so that we reach out to all the world with your love in our hearts and souls so that we can be inspired by the life of Christ and that the Holy Spirit can dwell within us so that we can be a beacon of light and love and hope for all the world. Amen. The closing hymn is number 671, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Please stand as you are able. with one another and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May we leave this place ready to be hearers of the word and doers also. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.